The end-to-end -end principle. The end-to-end -end principle is a simple theory that a mechanism or feature should not be placed in the network if it can be placed on an end system, and that the network itself should only provide a general service of forwarding information, not one that's tailored to any particular application. This theory, while it is simple, is one of the defining characteristics of the internet, and to truly understand it, we need to look at its original design philosophy. As the internet was proposed by DARPA, a military organization, many of its goals reflect battlefield and military ideals, with some of its main goals being survivability in the face of failure and the ability to support an arbitrary type of communication or application service. The end-to-end -end principle not only supports these initial goals, but it has shaped the internet we have today. Take, for example, the ability to reliably send a message despite any number of failures in a network. In order for the internet to work, if part of it were to fail, the state of communication would have to be preserved somehow. The main choices proposed to resolve this problem were replication in the network itself, or something known as fate sharing, which upholds the end-to-end -end principle. The way replication works is every time you send a message from A to B, the message is replicated to surrounding parts of the network, such that if one were to fail, the message could still be relayed by other parts of the network in order to be successfully received. This would solve the issue of survivability on a small scale. However, it adds a lot of complexity and overhead to the network itself, as you would need to replicate every transmission between hosts. This clearly violates the end-to-end -end principle, as the feature of reliable data transfer was implemented in the network itself. Fate sharing, on the other hand, upholds the end-to-end -end principle and only works on end systems, and it's actually similar to how people interact with each other. For example, if I were to ask for someone for the time in a crowded room and they were unable to hear me, I would notice that they hadn't received my question as they didn't respond or acknowledge me in any way and I would just simply ask my question again. Similarly, if fate sharing were to be used in the earlier example of sending a message from A to B, the message is sent only along the path from A to B, involving only parts of the network necessary for communication. If part of the network fails, A notices it didn't get a response from B, and it will simply send the message again, similar to what would happen if you asked a question to someone and you didn't get a response. This not only protects against an arbitrary number of failures in the network, regardless of scale, but it's also less complicated and it is easier to engineer. This leads to the view of the internet that we have today, where end systems like your computer are smart and the network that connects them is just dumb or stateless. With the network responsible only for forwarding information and keeping many of the features of the internet on end systems, it allows for any number of applications to use it as we see today. This flexibility allows for many new applications or features to be added to the internet without having to update the core network itself. This is how throughout the history of the internet, things like encryption, flow control, and reliability have been added to our services without the need to redesign how the core internet works for each advancement. By following the simple properties of the end-to-end -end principle, it has allowed for a simpler, more flexible, and open internet that we know today.